Hello, and welcome to Reflections on Film. In this video, I'm reaching for that low-hanging fruit and sticking to the world of So Bad They're Good Movies for a discussion on one of the absolute worst and subsequently funniest films I've ever seen. We'll be digging into the 1986 film The Messenger, written, produced, directed, and starring former NFL player Fred Williamson. And if that doesn't excite you, then it should, because if history has taught us anything, it's that when one man pays for himself to write, direct, and star in a movie, there's a good chance it's going to end up being really, really bad. By 73, I had formed my own company, Po' Boy Productions. And the reason I call it Po' Boy is so that if you ever work for me, don't ask for no money, because I got no cash to pay you. So yep, in the grand tradition of Neil Breen, John DeHart, Tommy Wiseau, and so many other of bad cinema's all-time greats, Fred Williamson takes audiences on a roller coaster ride of action and romance in this awkward movie co produced by an Italian company. So you know to expect only the highest quality from this one. Yeah. I thought that was neat. I did that in my Italian movie because <laughs> I'm Italian. Now, my impetus for making this video was really to highlight one scene from this film. One scene that is so mind blowingly bad and lacking in self awareness that I literally could not believe it had been committed to film after I watched it. This is the type of scene that should go down in bad movie history, and it's maybe the greatest example of hilariously unintentional irony, maybe in literary history. But before we dig into that scene, let's take a run through the plot, because this is just a ridiculous movie full of hilarious moments, and I love to laugh at stuff like this. That being said, the film does depict numerous deplorable actions, and so before we jump in, I have to warn anyone who isn't familiar with low-budget B-movies and might be off-put or have a negative reaction to violence, particularly violence against women, you should stop watching this video now. And ultimately, it's good to remind people that when we're laughing at these things, we're laughing at the unfathomable incompetence required of a filmmaker to try and use this horrible subject matter to exploit their audiences. We're not laughing at the violence or encouraging it in any way. We're always laughing at the stupidity of the filmmaker. Okay, so with that disclaimer out of the way, let's jump into the story. The Messenger follows a former Green Beret and ex-convict named Jake. Or wait, Sebastian. Jake Sebastian. Jacob Sebastian. What is this guy's name again? And you, sir? Jake. Sebastian Trent. All right, that didn't really clear things up for me. So we're just going to call him Jake. And at the outset of the film, Jake is just being released from an Italian prison. Now, the film never tells us that the opening takes place in Italy, but... The thickly accented men surrounding Fred Williamson quickly become a dead giveaway. Ciao, Luigi. Come va? What is this? Judgment day. I stole nothing. I just don't have it. Those are both wrong answers. Goodbye, Luigi. Now, apparently Jake is something of a jack-of-all-trades. A Jake-of-all-trades, if you will. Not only is he a former Green Beret and badass killer, but, and for seemingly no reason whatsoever, the film won't stop telling us that Jake is also a musical prodigy, even though this is never relevant to the larger story. Former Vietnam vet, weapons expert, a Green Beret, a musical prodigy of sorts, born and raised in Chicago. I know my story, Gilgood, what's yours? We never even see him pick up a musical instrument. You go back to your music. Music never went any place. Yeah. So Jake is reunited with his lover, Sabrina. She's been waiting for him to be released all these years, and oh my god, that was quick. We're less than 10 minutes into this movie, and I've already seen literally every inch of Sabrina's body. And way too much of Fred Williamson's, too. After a needlessly long sex scene, we finally get to actually hear from Sabrina, and holy shit, look at that banner. If you didn't know this movie was taking place in Italy, you'd think that Charlie from Sunny in Philly was in charge of the set design for this scene. Taxes, they'll be lower. Son, the Democratic vote for me is right thing to do, Philadelphia. So do. This doesn't make any sense. All right, well then, just say whatever you want. 
But as the two talk, we learn that Sabrina has become addicted to drugs while Jake was in prison. So, of course, following this revelation, the two decide to go to a party. And what? This is a totally normal party where totally normal things happen. Sabrina gets a phone call and learns that her drug-dealing friend Luigi was killed, but before she can tell Jake that her life is in danger, the bad guys show up and try to take her life. Despite the battery of their getaway car dying, our assassins are at least sort of successful. Sabrina is gunned down, and now Jake is out for revenge. Following a pretty weird visit to Sabrina's recently dug grave, where Jake vows to become a chef for some reason. I don't know what I'll do. I guess I'll go someplace and open up a restaurant. Call it Sebastian's. Jake meets with an Italian crime boss who says that the mafia put the hit out on Sabrina. They say for me two weeks ago, my stepson Luigi has been killed by the same group of people that had your son. And he offers Jake half a million dollars to go take revenge on them. So, naturally, Jake decides to practice his kung fu in the courtyard. And I mean, just look at those moves. Jake's sweet kung fu moves draw the attention of a young lady who works on the property. And let's just say this young lady does not live what you would call an easy life. Before berating her for letting the men in her life beat and abuse her, Jake storms off, leaving her alone for the men in her life to, you guessed it, continue beating and abusing her. But Jake returns just in the nick of time to save her from a couple of creepy dudes and have them arrested for their heinous crimes. Wait, he did what? Tell your stuff someplace else. Right. You won't be seeing this again. Yeah, that's right. Jake lets them go. And he gives them their drugs back. I mean, why bother calling the police? We wouldn't want to ruin these young white boys' lives by charging them with felony crimes, which they definitely committed and almost are certainly going to try and commit again. Anyway, Jake leaves the young lady alone again, and this time, when she is inevitably approached by a male assailant, because the universe this film is set in is a nightmare world for anyone who doesn't have a Y chromosome, this time Jake isn't able to save her. But he goes in for revenge, and after a tussle in the shed, Jake smashes the dude's head with a shovel. But I guess things aren't really going to slow down, because when Jake takes the young lady out to lunch for some reason, guess who's hot on their tail? That's right, it's Shovelhead. He isn't dead, and now he wants revenge. And apparently the Italian cop from earlier is also on Jake's tail too for some reason? Seriously, what the f*** is going on? So the young lady is killed. That makes Jake 0 for 2 when it comes to protecting young women from gun violence. And he lies to the police one more time, just for good measure, I guess, before leaving the scene of a crime that he should definitely be formally questioned about. And apparently he walks out of that scene directly onto the streets of Chicago. And luckily the friendly neighborhood deli shop owner with impeccable taste in headwear has all the information Jake needs. I mean, come on. That hat is just beautiful. With all the info he needs in hand, Jake charges into the hideout of a drug-dealing pimp named Sweet Louie, and holy cow. Look at this guy's suit. I think I just found my Halloween costume for next year. Now, after Jake roughs up the dealers inside the apartment, Sweet Louie tries to escape on foot, eventually hiding out in a local bar, and just take a look at these intimidating bar patrons. Nothing says tough like Coke bottle glasses and awkwardly fitting baseball hats. So Jake takes out Sweet Louie, and it's incredibly embarrassing for Sweet Louie. Die slow, Louie. Heaven won't miss you. Go to hell! Not before you, pal. Meanwhile, the cops begin to take notice of Jake's murder spree, and oh yeah, that's right. Cameron Mitchell is in this movie as the lead police officer on Jake's tail. The serial killer. No, Leroy, we better start watching TV. You might pop up on 60 Minutes, or better still, you might wind up on Barbara Wallace. Oh, f***ing shit. From here, the movie goes into a sort of tailspin as Jake begins to target white-collar drug dealers and mafia bosses while the police try to keep up with all the mayhem. And I mean, just look at some of the action in this film. 
This car blows up for no reason. It's just, it's terrible. So after this cacophony of violence and poorly delivered exposition from our pursuing detectives, we finally get to the main event of the film, Jake's final assault on the home of the big bad mafia boss. The cops are there to try and get ahead of Jake's murderous rampage, but not even a long-winded monologue from Cameron Mitchell can stop Jake from swooping in and exacting revenge. Took you so long. Not you again. Look, I don't care if you're a fed. You back off my case. Now, I got some hard ball playing friends in high places who smash your nuts for fun. And the way you keep praising this vigilante freak would cause them to lean heavily on you. You got that? And, whoa, wait a minute. Look at the scope on that revolver. Oh my god, please for one second imagine someone looking down the scope of a gun like this and pulling the trigger. Finally, Jake makes it into the house, clears out the cops. It's a grenade! Takes out the final mafia boss. And after all this, all the murder and revenge, Jake finally returns to Italy, only to learn that the crime boss who sent him to Chicago was just using him to take out rival drug traffickers. And in one final and really sort of underwhelming shootout, Jake takes out the Italian crime boss and the credits roll over a blurry freeze frame. Wow, what a fucking movie, right? I mean, it's just so nonsensical and ridiculous that I had to go through the whole thing. And we didn't even get to talk about the music, really. Oh my god, the music. But now that we're through it all, I hope you'll agree with me in saying that it really is an awful and yet joyous film to behold. It has all the charm of a film made by a delusional writer-director star mixed with the lovably deplorable and exploitative qualities of your standard low-budget Italian rip-off movie. Add a heaping scoop of Cameron Mitchell absolutely chewing the scenery, and I'd say you've got yourself a recipe for the type of bad movie that might deserve to go down in history. But this isn't just some random YouTube video about a funny bad movie. No, no, no. This is serious film analysis here. Because now is the time when we get to talk about irony, and how unintentional irony can be the funniest thing in the world. So, just for educational purposes, let's Take a look at the definition of irony. And now I present to you the most hilariously ironic scene in cinema history. A scene that I like to call the world's greatest caretaker. Time you want to kick some ass, try a man. Please, Mr. Turner, spare him. He has his problems, but uh, he has a such a great character. I'm gonna kill you! And there it is. Wow, what an absolute masterpiece of awful cinema, right? I mean, everything about this scene is just incredible. From the unshakable casualness of our heroic Fred Williams as he ambles onto a stone porch, to the sound of the fartiest bass line since Ace of Bass was a thing, all the way to the delivery of the most perfectly ironic line I've ever heard an actor spit out of his mouth. I mean, did they have to use the term caretaker? He's literally doing what I would describe as the exact opposite of taking care of anything. I mean, there's just no way that this guy is such a great caretaker that his landscaping and floriculture skills could be so overwhelmingly powerful as to justify or excuse this kind of behavior. I mean, mainly because there is no excuse for that kind of behavior. But damn, how good must this guy's rose bushes be? All right, this film has sufficiently broken my brain. So that's where we're going to wrap up this video. I know I spoiled most of it, but I do recommend this film to anyone out there who loves so bad they're good movies. And to anyone out there who is waiting for more serious film analysis, don't worry. Um, I'm going to do some more serious stuff in the future. I'm actually working on a more in-depth breakdown of a film that I'm really excited to put together. 
But for now, I just wanted to revel in the world of bad movies for a little bit. And hopefully moving forward between larger, you know, more in-depth projects, I'll be able to keep my creative juices flowing by producing more videos like this one. Videos that are just meant to be fun diversions that explore all sorts of movies that fascinate me. And I guess that means for now, there's nothing left for me to say, but once again, this has been Reflections on Film, and as always, thanks for watching.